Hey everyone, in this video we'll be looking at chapter 8, which is combining objects with composition. Sandy gives a great definition right at the beginning of the chapter. Composition is the act of combining distinct parts into a complex whole, such that the whole becomes more than the sum of its parts. See where this is going with the, with the bike example? Right, up to this point we've just been looking at a bicycle class, and now we're going to split them up into, into several classes. Um, in the past, we've been looking at inheritance as a way to structure our behavior and attributes, and, and composition is an alternate design pattern to that. It's, it's an alternative to inheritance, and, and we'll see that in a minute. The bicycle class is a happy, it's a happy, like, very tangible example for you, right? Bicycles are, are made up of parts, and so we're going to be diving into, like, that in particular. Now... Forget everything that we've done with bikes so far because we don't need it anymore. We're not doing the inheritance thing. Think just think just of the parts. We're going to make a parts class and then go from there. Parts can respond to the spares message because spares are an aspect of parts. Like you need you need to have spares of parts. So take a look at this example here on 165 and 66. There's going to be a parts class, and then road bike parts and mountain bike parts will inherit from that. So you get a lot of a lot of behavior here, which is nice that that you don't have to to rewrite later. This is you know classic inheritance, and that that shall be familiar to you. And so this is kind of a diagram of of what that looks like, right? Mountain bike parts inherits from this, and and you know, all of the parts together comprise a bicycle. By the way, check out here, this is what actually instantiating a bicycle looks like when you're when you're running in this composition style of design. So you have the bicycle.new and then for parts you just do road bike parts.new. And same thing here for bicycle.new and then mountain bike parts new. We have the parts class going on. Now we need to dive into the part itself, right? And this is where composition starts to take off. And check this out on page 169. So an instance of a bicycle has parts, and the parts object is comprised of many individual part objects, and the part object here doesn't actually, so it, it has the attributes of what a part itself comprises of. And that was all sounding very abstract. Thankfully, there's, you know, a concrete example right here. Part.new, name, chain, description, 10 speed, you know, tire size, uh, description, 23. You can, you can easily say, here are the road bike parts, here are the, the mountain bike parts, and so on. And because you've already defined this is what a chain is, this is what a road tire is, this is what you know a mountain tire is, and so on, you can collect those definitions together and it'll make it super fast for you to instantiate bicycles as a whole later because you can just call tape and you can just call road tire and chain and so on. And you can actually see that here. It's a, it's a very nice example, right? road bike parts is an instance of parts comprised of these particular part objects. And then to, you know, take it back even further to the instantiating a bicycle level, to get back to that level, it's bicycle.new and then for your parts piece, there it is, you're instantiating the, the individual part objects. So it's getting like faster and faster, you're getting a lot of functionality in in one line of code here. Now that you now that you have your parts class going, you're probably going to want it to act like an array. And the nice thing is you can actually just have it inherit from array, and then you'll be able to call things like dot size, dot length, um, you know, things like that. And that's that's very easy. So now we're going to switch to talking about factories, which is going to be somewhat unfamiliar. It hasn't been covered here before, but hopefully it's not intimidating. 
and the the reason that it could potentially be a little bit a little bit strange to see it first is because we'll be dealing with some data structures that we haven't run into before. Sandy kind of assuages us by saying that factories are just objects that make other objects. So let's stop being intimidated and check out page 177. On line six, you're getting the new parts instance and you're getting all of the individual components that it owns instantiated on line eight. And in line seven, it's going through all of the elements passed originally here in the config and assigning them to the individual part instances. It's, it's pretty, like it's, it's pretty genius. It's pretty genius. So part class, part, parts class. Parts, you know, this is definitely worth like taking a couple minutes to like pause the video and just like see what's going on. You know, parts class is instantiating this um, and so on. Part class, you know, that's instantiating that. Um, it's, it does, and it does take like a minute to sort of see like, okay, which messages are getting passed where, but it's, uh, it's really cool and it's very helpful. Now, Sandy says that the whole situation can be distilled down into an open struct. What is an open struct? And what is a struct, which is very closely related? A struct is a data only class in Ruby. That means that you can't add action methods on it. It doesn't store behavior. If you go into an IRB terminal, which we'll do here, and do car equals struct.new color wheels, you can then do a equals car dot new and then pass it blue and four wheels and then you'll have that and you'll have all of the methods associated with structs but you'll notice that you can't add a, a class method or an instance method it's it's a data only structure so that's basically what a struct is and an open struct is I would say comparable to a hash in the sense that it's keys and values stored together and it's very lightweight in fact it's way more lightweight than a hash even in the sense that if you do like if you have an instance of it and you do dot methods dot count there will be 69 methods on the open struct and 146 on the hash resource wise it, it takes up less and it also has less functionality with it and that's a trade-off for you to think about. So that's a tangent. On 179, we have the open struct here that you can see. I would say more or less you can think of it as a hash. The create part method gets called on each of the elements in the config that was passed in earlier. So this is the same situation where it's like worth pausing the video and looking at that for a couple minutes and seeing, you know, keys and you know, where the values get populated from and whatnot. Now, we have to take a, a look at something called forwardable for a minute, and this is pretty important in terms of keeping your code concise. Forwardable is a module that lets you take the behavior, the methods, actions, whatever you want to call it, of another class and make them accessible in the class that's, that's extending forwardable. So say, for example, you're creating a parts class like we are here, and you want to be able to call part singular, call part methods on it without rewriting it. This is how you do it. So you can see that on 181 lines 14, 16, and 17. 17 is on 181, and then require forwardable and extend are happening here on 180. So look at this line, def delegators, parts, size each. And basically what that means is that it will extract those those methods from part and make them available here. I'll leave you to look a little more in depth in these examples and just looking at how like you go from having a uh, well this is a 2D array you know having a 2D array and then going all the way to ultimately being able to 
to create bikes with that. Spend, spend some time looking at how the messages get passed. You instantiate the parts factory here and you pass it the mountain config. So that goes here and it takes the config and then it like makes the parts. Um, it's, really, it's really genius. I think whoever came up with this is very, very smart. So now that we've taken kind of a, a long look at inheritance and composition, Sandy recommends composition over inheritance on the basis of its structural independence. So inheritance, by contrast, requires the relationships between objects to be hierarchical permanently, while composition doesn't have that. But that said, composition isn't always guaranteed to be like the best way to go. And so the next section is kind of about the costs and benefits between the two design patterns, accepting the, the consequences of inheritance, right? Inheritance is very intuitive. You have the bicycle class from which all other bikes stem, and so you have something like a pedal method that's in bicycle because that's going to be the same for all bikes, and you have the individual tire sizes in the individual classes because that will vary from type of bike to type of bike. And, and that's very intuitive. And probably more importantly, if you need to make a big change for all bikes, you can make that change in one place, and every bike you've ever made or ever will make in the app will, will be updated instantly. But on the downside, if you have an incorrectly formed hierarchy, adding behavior later is tricky because you can't put that behavior in one segment of code. It's everywhere. I've worked on a project in the past where the design pattern was to have one class and use polymorphism to manifest, manifest it in over a dozen different ways, and that's just tough to maintain. It's easy to add behavior to all of them because it's just adding to the one class, but you know, how would you add a behavior on one of those incarnations? It's kind of tricky. Probably not impossible, but it is tricky. Composition, on the other hand, is much more context independent, right? Remember how we were just passing a 2D array by the time we got to the end of the example? It was, it was very easy. There's no baggage with that from other classes, which is nice. And that means in the future you can make changes, maybe updating the number of parts that comprise a bike, and it doesn't even phase the parts factory because that kind of support is already cooked in. On the other hand, composition is harder to understand intuitively, at least in my opinion. I think inheritance comes more naturally to me, but Sandy says that the loss of automatic message delegation is the big downside to composition. And I can, I can see that being a big thing once your entity relationships get big enough. So what to make of all of this? She wrote a, a very handy summary that you should think of. There are three, three different kinds of relationships. Is a is the first one. Behaves like a is the second one. And has a. And those are how you should be deciding between inheritance composition and duct typing. So think of this. If you have a road bike wheel, it is a wheel. You can, you can use inheritance from a wheel there. On the other hand, a bike has a wheel, therefore composition of bike parts. And then finally, behaves like a, for things like schedulable, applies on everything from a mechanic to a bike to tools and so on because scheduling behavior is the same. And so you do a duct type there for schedulable. That's about it for chapter eight. And to be honest, it's kind of the pinnacle of the book because chapter nine is about tests, which are important, but proximate to object-oriented programming. If you can understand these various design patterns of inheritance, composition, and duct typing, you can basically take a scene from the real world and model it in a code format, whether it's a bicycle shop, a coffee cafe, or anything else. And I hope that's been helpful for you. I'll see you all in the next video.